So now today the question is, or the challenge for the iconographer is, what forms actually accomplishes pictorially what St. Dionysius describes as, as the functional process of the apathetic, you know, like uh, getting rid of the unessentials, you know? And I would say that is a process of conceptualization and simplification of form and finding the right balance between naturalism and abstraction not going too far into abstraction into a platonic kind of like at you know um, intellectualism that deprecates uh, uh, the body and sense uh, this reality uh, neither going so far into naturalism where that's all you could think of like your 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 the appearances of, of things so the, the key is the, the 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 maximian notion of the logoi you know like the inner principles of created beings and so what i would contend i have a passage that i'd like to read to you i don't want to keep on going i want to give other people opportunity but this i think the passage is important it's from plotinus and he said um uh, he's talking about how we shouldn't despise the work of the craftsman because he says the arts uh, he says uh, okay he says uh, there, anyone who uh, despises or dishonors the arts must know that the arts do not simply imitate what they see but they run back to the forming principles Logoi, from which nature derives. Now, he gives an example, right? He says that, he also says actually pertaining to beauty, which is pertinent. He says that uh, that the craftsman also uh, The, the works possess beauty. They make up what is defective in things, okay? Some people wouldn't like that, right? Because they would, they would wanna think, oh, everything that we see is like, is the way it should be. And so there's not defective or whatever, right? But that goes back to what we we're discussing before about the whole, like the, the, the union is there, but the union is also broken. So it, it needs to be brought into its intended end. Okay, so, so the beauty that we are to be depicting is a, an aspiration for that eschatological beauty, right? And so now, he says that for Phidias, like the famous sculptor, too, did not make his Zeus from any model perceived by the senses, which is very pertinent for iconography, right? But understood what Zeus would look like if he wanted to make himself visible, which is a very interesting idea. Okay, so, so um, now I'm gonna give you a paragraph which probably is a little bit lengthy, but I think it's important. It's an interpretation of this passage by Cornelia Sakiridou. Uh, I'm probably saying her name wrong because I'm not good in Greek, right? So a Greek uh, last name. She wrote an excellent book, which I recommend called Icons in Time, Persons in Eternity, Orthodox Theology and the Aesthetics of the Christian Image, right? And she says this, which is very important. Although intelligible logoi, should not be understood theoretically uh, or abstractly, but as given in the concrete act of a thing's existence, which is the very Dionysian thing. Although she critiques Dionysius, which I don't agree with her, I, I've been keeping in conversation with her and we defer on our understanding of Dionysius. But ironically, in this statement, she's actually speaking the, in a Dionysian way. Uh, in this case uh, of the sculpted Zeus, now Logos is the living reality of a thing. 
not its explanation or concept. Moreover, this act is an act of self-manifestation. The art object, in this case, a statue, embodies it because it has been made dynamically, vividly, through logoi, rather than through aesthetics or superficial impressions. Phidias statue does not represent Zeus and posit him as a model. It brings him to life by its own means, its own act of existence, exactly the sense of energia. Okay, that is, I think, the realm that we're dealing with. And that, in my view, it is a very complicated thing because the problem is we're now dealing with metaphysical issues. Before we were dealing with concrete making an icon issues, right? And so uh, my frustration, which goes back to that article on the aesthetics of deification, is that everybody talks about beauty. Everybody talks, oh, yeah, icons are supposed to be beautiful. But it's like, yes, I mean, God is beauty. I mean, we know. But, you know, it's not so simple as to say we got to go back to beauty. It's like, what beauty are you talking about? Because, you know, you're talking about, about an embodied thing. You're talking about manif the manifestation of something. But in that process of manifestation, you encounter the deception of appearances, like Plato says. And, and, and that's not, that's not, and in saying that, that's not a deprecation of appearances. It's just we have to acknowledge that there is a component of ambiguity in beauty that we have to be careful about. And the challenge for the iconographer is to deal with how, like, can he accomplish what we just uh, read, right? Uh, tapping into the logoi, because the logoi is ultimately a manifestation, or it's the logoi is as the inner principles is there, there. They're the word that the Lord uttered in the beginning of creation, right? And so, so inevitably, it also entails beauty. Because insofar as something is, it's already beautiful. Because it, it, it is in its acts of existence that it participates in beauty. And so the, 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 the manifesting or capturing the logoi, the inner principle of recreated beings, is by de facto a wanting to unveil the beauty of things as St. Dionysius is talking about, right? right? But this cannot be formulaically put on a table and say, you know, oh, you just paint icons like the ones in the 15th century and you're guaranteed you're going to have a beautiful icon. Right, right. Duplicate Byzantine churches and, and, and paintings and by default, you're going to have beauty. It's like, no, no. It's like, we have to take into account our uniqueness now without betraying tradition, but we have to enter into that dynamic encounter with the Logoi that then makes of the work a living manifestation. And that's not an easy thing to, to do, and you cannot, you cannot codify it anyways. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I almost want to bring up back up your icon because I was thinking... Um... You know, I mean, maybe one way of thinking about this uh, is, I mean, when you talk about, it seems like we, when it comes to um, sensible things, uh, it's key that we include a sort of dynamism, like you suggested, to the sensible. And I'm thinking about here how, I mean, we were talking about before how the, um, you know, we have the yellowish uh, bright color of his hair and that's um but that's set against the background of this kind of reversion toward the god beyond being so it's like on the one hand you have this um this apophatic dimension of reversion withdrawal uh toward the one beyond being but then you also have this sort of uh procession this yes. uh, uh this agopic return in um that that gold and bright and so i'm just thinking how it seems like maybe a key 
dimension of the sensible is that if we want to convey, if divine beauty should come through the sensible, the sensible has to be given a kind of depth where the invisible um, is, of course, it, the invisible, you know, God beyond being cannot be literally contained um, directly in, in the sensible, but somehow the sensible has to include the concealment yeah. as it were like uh so i'm, I'm thinking you know it, in another article that you mentioned uh the one by uh uh dr ivanovich um mm -hmm. pseudo dionysius and the importance of uh, sensible things he quotes dionysius saying um dionysius affirms that the divine ray quote can enlighten us only by being upliftingly concealed in a variety of sacred veils, which the providence of the Father adapts to our nature as human beings. So I think this idea of an uplifting concealment, mm -hmm. it's like the sensible can somehow retain the mark of what is concealed and what can never be revealed yes. sensibly. But when the sensible includes that mark, then it has that depth uh, mm -hmm. It has that kind of restorative uh, depth, which can help us um, in our own. Uh... Yeah. And I think I think um, the way that depth is actually uh, conveyed is through a maintaining the um, uniqueness of the iconographer as much as the created beings that he or she is representing. Because if you create a situation that in which the icon is purely formula, you're not gonna have depth. <laughs> you're, you're gonna lose that um, in inevitable like dynamism that 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 you you need i mean uh you know the interesting thing you pointed out you're talking about the blue and you're talking about the yellow and it just dawned on me that kandinsky has exactly that juxtaposition between uh, between blue as receding and then hence eternal right and but but then the, like the here the yellow is like coming forth so it's like it's it's pictorially is an a lot it's, a, it's an analogy of like um uh eminence and transcendence you know what i'm saying and so, but, um, but that, that even, even, even if that, you know, that wasn't a deliberate thing for, for me to do this. Right. I mean, I, I wasn't thinking in those theological terms when I chose to, 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 to uh, select that color for the hair uh, in juxtaposition with the blue. But it happened as part of the intuitive process of the image that would have been, I, I would have been deprived of it if the icon was just basically all colors are predetermined. And, you know, and, and so you have to abide by this dogmatization of like every component for it to be accepted as a traditional form. And I think if, you do not open it enough for the living component of human creativity to enter into it, then you're, you're not going to be factoring into that process. The organs of perception, you know, uh, it's, I, I think, I don't know who it was. I think it might've been, uh, I think it might've been like uh, Meister Eckhart who said something like uh, uh the eyes see for not if there's no mind behind them or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, they go hand in hand. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you have to have like this, like uh, noetic discernment that goes into the process. Um, and, um, and so, you know, and, 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 and that is, if it's genuine, you will you will discern it. There is no other way. It's like you know you know you know when you have it when you see it. You know it's like, but they, there is no way to like actually uh, um, uh, predict it. 
I was wondering if I could <clears throat> follow up um, before maybe uh, Marcus uh, gives a question, um, because I was thinking about this question of uh, ascent or withdrawal and then descent or return. And y'all were talking about it in connection with these colors. Um, and I was reminded of your article again, uh, Aesthetics of Deification, um, when you talk about the connection between knowledge and beauty. Um, and I think you talk about uh, mm. how you have to sort of ascend to the archetype of beauty in contemplation that then allows you to then depict beauty uh, in the soul. Um, so I was wondering if there's like a relationship between knowledge and beauty um, where once the archetype is contemplated in some sort of union, um, then it's possible that to emerge in a sort of visible manifestation of that archetype of beauty, which is itself beautiful, but it's the visible manifestation of the archetype. Um, and then that visible manifestation, it's available to others in the world. So I'm thinking about like Moses coming down from the mountain, mm -hmm. like a saint. Yeah. And then they see that manifestation of beauty, and then they have perhaps the desire themselves to go towards the archetype and have knowledge. Yeah. And then come back again in a, another descent. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this, this relation of ascending and descending is connected to knowledge and beauty, or at least beauty as it appears versus the archetype of beauty. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I think, well, I, I'm, it's funny that you bring this whole whole thing about knowledge. I mean, I, there's a passage that I say like there, that I write there in the beginning and then towards, I think the area where, that you're discussing right now, uh, beauty has to do with cognition, right? And that is, I think Aquinas said, I said, said that. But I mean, he's working from like a medieval understanding of like the Dionysian corpus. I mean, I'll be, we know that there's problems with that whole thing, right? But it, it, regardless, and in hindsight, I'm like, well, that's true, but there is also beauty is that which pleases when it is seen. Okay, so there's that. And then there is beauty is an uncreated energy of God, right? Because beauty is God himself, you know? So there's all these different levels and I think they're not all mutually exclusive. The danger is to like actually want to like turn it into one, one rigid system. And also like, for example, like the, the Lord himself, which is the archetype that we're concerned with, with a capital A, he is, he had no, he was not comedy and he had no form. Right, he was he was like crucified, and so 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 he was the 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 bridegroom, the the the, the sufferer of Isaiah, right? So so there are all, and, but but he's beauty, and so there there is all these different components. Oh, by the way, um, Samuel introduced me to uh, Byung Chul Han, the philosopher, and I was looking him up. And he wrote this book, which I just got recently, called Saving Beauty. And he had he had this like uh yeah, yeah, right here, man. So yeah, so so he has this notion of like the turning beauty into the Burkean notion of like, you know, that which pleases when it is seen, right? The softness, right? Voluptuousness. And and then divorcing beauty from the sublime. So in 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 Burke's you know the inquiry into our philosophical notions of the sublime and the beautiful, right? Which became standard at like Kant. Then later on, actually, uh, did a piece on 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 beauty and the sublime that actually was influenced by him. So so there is a dimension in which we have to bring those two components together. And they're brought together because you could say the sublime is that which like, you know, it like it, it, it's threatening, right? It's like the divinity as like the terror, you know, that we encounter or like it goes beyond our, even our capacity to conceptualize 
and it like you feel like you are like you're you, you're threatened like your life is literally threatened like let's say when you experience nature like storms and things like that which in 19th century romantic painting became thematic so so it's something larger than your minuscule like you know existence right and then but the sense but 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 beauty as that which is pleases is something that it's like it's like more like you grasp it you can like control it like it's you know and so we have to bring those two things back together and the way you bring it back together is through jesus the incarnate god he yeah. is he is the symbol of symbols he is imminence and transcendence in a person uh, you know and so that hypostatic union you know uh, without confusion or division is the is, that holds the mystery of what what's going on we have to enter into knowledge of him that enables us to be able to discern when we are actually pictorially elaborating something whether we are erring from that archetypal model but i mean how do you um, you know how do you know that and there's a danger another danger is some people would like it to be that if you're a saint then you could by default paint the greatest icons that's not true some saints painted icons and i'm sorry they're not the greatest icons and some people would get scandalized but that's just true you know i mean and some people who were probably flagrant sinners in the medieval period believe me a lot of the stuff that we have now we revere it as like prototypes of like beauty coming out of holiness we don't know who did these things and these craftsmen were like every single one of us at times good or you know only god is good but you know what i mean uh, times more you know middle of the road sometimes doing good you know i mean or, or sometimes bad and so and so we can't simplify things too much but i think it is important to keep in mind the balance of uh, the tension that there has to be in the conceptualization of beauty pictorially the western classical model has become debased into romantic kitsch. Like, you know, and, and unfortunately, even with, you know, within the church, when people say beauty will save the world, what do they really have in mind? Ironically, they have an 18th century Kantian notion of beauty <laughs> because they want to see 19th century paintings, you know, as standards of like traditional art or in the realm of icon painting, a mechanistic notion of beauty that is formulaic, where you could only do specific icons based on a specific historical period. See, and so therefore, um, that's why in that article, I was bringing it back to the soul, because it becomes too treacherous to, to basically predicate it in terms of like aesthetic pictorial formulas. And so we have to, as iconographers or anyone, any, you know, just, I go into it in the article, it, it goes beyond whether you're a monk iconographer, it's all anybody who is working towards the return back to the source, right? The arrows of repentance, right? So, you know, uh, we have to um, look and behold with the eyes of our, mind, of, of our heart the the ultimate archetype and if we don't then we become simulacra of ourselves you know uh approximations fake versions of human beings not true persons in the likeness of the true human christ the true person thank you uh, that was really good uh, this has been great so far we're approaching about an hour and a half. I wanted to get Marcus in here. I think he, he wanted to ask a question. Um, and then maybe we could uh, bring it to a close after that. Yeah, thank you for meeting with us, Father Silwan. I just wanted to ask a question um, about the icon. Sam, could you bring that back up? 
wanted to ask about, um, I guess, the position of, you said this was the gospel that he's yes. holding mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about the position of that, both in respect to its uh, processing furthest toward us out from the mm -hmm. noetic background. It's uh, not set back like the, the halo, but it's coming forth. And it's also, uh, um, is, is there a significance to that? Could you talk about that? And also its position at the sort of bottom right of the icon, obviously he has to be holding it, but right. is there further this meaning is, to that? This is all related. I think uh, if you look at uh, the depiction of bishops, they tend to be depicted iconologically like Christ as the teacher. So usually the form is Christ blessing with the right hand. Um, and then he has the gospel on the left. There is like symbolism of the right and the left, the right righteousness left, you know, is like, you know, authority and things like that, or, you know, various ways of, of, of looking at it, uh, which I, I can't remember right now. But um, the uh, one of the important things about iconography that I, I've been actually uh, running into, or I have been uh, studying for a while now, but it's become more important as something that I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of now than I was years back, is the, how the icon is meant to enter into a relational um, situation with the viewer where the person represented enters into our space. Okay, I'm sure you've noticed that in a lot of icons, the halo extends over the border, like this one does, right? This border is pretty much a uh, relief. It's because the, the inner part is carved into, right? And so the border is, is, is relief. So um, also you see, for example, like icons where like some components are extending out like part of a mountain or like, you know, a painting, a, a, an icon that, that I did of St. Onufrius, he's stepping into our space by stepping onto the bottom border. And so <clears throat> there are different cues in which the actual image um, is both parallel to the picture plane and then the form, uh, the way is highlighted, uh, then pops out. So the irony is that I, the icon is usually discussed in, in, in popular uh, interpretations as flat because they compare it to the um, Western perspectival kind of like most of representation, right? So uh, where you are to imagine the painting as a window and you, it's, it becomes sort of like a, although in a way is parallel to your sense experience, it is, it sets up a stage like kind of like distanced, disconnected kind of like environment, right? Um, in iconography, generally what you have is a very shallow space, but the, but the, it's not completely flat because the there is a corporeality that to the forms. I mean, granted, there are periods like in late antiquity, like the depictions of like uh, uh, Theodora and like the retinue in Ravenna, for example. Like you know, there was a, a, a periods in 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 the development of iconography where like things were were much more uh, um, flat flatter, but eventually after iconoclasm, things you know, developed in a way where like there is an emphasis of, of, of form. And so then the figure basically pops out. But um, in this case, um, it is more shallow in a way. It's not completely flat. But the gospel then becomes the, it introduces you into the space of the paint of the, of the saint. The saint is not completely out of your, you know, out of contact with the viewer, but it's slightly further back from the actual gospel. And so he is basically is presented as the um, the one who divides the word of truth. 
And so, um, uh, but also the, the, if you will notice that perspective is a little bit like it's got aspects of what they call reverse perspective. It's almost like a cubist kind of gospel, which I kind of like that, but anyway, so, but I don't know what, I don't know what else uh, you have in mind. I mean, does that explain a little bit? It, it, I call it a form of illusionism, but it's not, it's not illusionism like, like, you know, uh, Renaissance illusionism, but it does have a sense of, of having a, in my view, a palpable definition of space in which certain things in the image, although a shallow space, are more prominent, closer to the viewer than others. And the gospel is the one, in my view, that has, you know, um, perhaps like the most prominent, you know, it pops out more. Yeah, thank you. And um, it almost seems like uh, Dionysius the figure is sort of like the mediator between the the uh, noetic remoteness and the yes. um, message that he's presenting yes. us with. Yeah, I mean, because he's, you know, you could see the the, the halo as you know, the ultimate apathetic icon of the eternal and the divine. And it is, you know, it is circular. It's like, actually, you know, I'm sure you all know or are familiar with the, 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 the linear, the spiral and the circular forms of prayer that Dionysius talks about, you know, and then the gospel is like, uh, is, 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 is rectangular, is, is, is square, not square, but it's, it's got more of a cube-like form, which is like the immediate manifestation. Again, it's like you could say you could say that it is similar to um, it, it parallels what the yellow hair does in relationship with the circle, the, the circular blue, um, immanence and transcendence, and the gospel as a representation of the you know the incarnation. It preaches the incarnation. And so it like it is the it is like through which we are, you know, it makes accessible that which transcends all conception, but that it, you have to be initiated into that, and you have to have a hierophant to teach you the way. And Saint Dionysius is the hierophant, the theurgist of liturgical symbols. <laughs> Yes, that was great. Uh, so this has been a wonderful discussion. I mean, it's been very rich. Uh, there's all kinds of avenues that we could explore further. Um, just thank you so much for your time. It's Arnold. been my pleasure. I mean, I think you guys are doing a great thing. I think all these discussions are extremely valuable and helpful um, because uh, St. Dionysius is a very important figure, as you know, you know, with St. Maximus the Confessor. He has become, in recent scholarship, one of the most prominent thinkers and philosopher theologians that you know people are taking serious. And I think uh, it's, in my view, partly because um, he has the answer for a lot of the questions that contemporary is plaguing contemporary man and his dilemmas. Um, you know, postmodernism led to a form of apophaticism, but it was an apophaticism that it was nihilistic, but he gives you an apophaticism that is full of hope and uh, leads to deification. And that's what people want. And they seek it in other forms of religion, like Eastern religions, because they don't realize that we have through the mystical theology, what, you know, our, our subcultures have been looking for since the sixties, you know? Um, but it is it's got the right balance, the right balance. It doesn't compromise incarnation and it is theophanic. And that's what we need. Great. Uh, so before we let you go, do you have any current projects that you're working on that you want to? Uh, right now I'm working on an icon of the woman clothed with the sun, which is based on uh, the apocalypse uh, vision. Um, I think it might be the 12th chapter of the apocalypse. Um, and it is often in the iconologic tradition interpreted as uh, uh, both an image of the church and the mother of God. And so I, um, I'm working on that now. That's, I'm blocking in the colors now. I actually did some of the uh, painting of the uh, highlights on the mother of God's uh, 
uh, vestments, her vesture. And, um, and it actually incorporates a color palette that is indebted to Tibetan painting and uh, also the dragon, the seven headed dragon um, is also indebted to Chinese and Tibetan painting. And so I'm looking forward to getting that done and then somehow getting it out there for people to see and see what the reaction is. So oh, that sounds amazing. So yeah, we'd definitely be looking forward to seeing that. And again, it's been a it's been a wonderful discussion. And um hopefully we could do it again. So yeah, definitely. And um and uh yeah, and uh when you put this up, if you know, whenever you do, uh let me know because um, you know, I, I like to share with other people and get the name of your organization out. So that way they could start looking at your uh, blog and, and, and your videos. That's Absolutely. important. Okay. Thanks again, Father Silwan. Have a blessed rest of your day. Thank God bless you. Thank Bye. you for everything. All right. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you for everybody. And pleasure to meet you. Yeah, take care. Have a good day.